Yat e bene. Good morning, Myers Park Baptist Church. It is very good to be with you today. I am honored and grateful to Reverend Mia McLean for inviting me to speak with you today. We had a very good discussion earlier this week regarding the doctrine of discovery, and um, I was honored that I was asked to also preach um, to you today on Sunday. Before we begin, please let me introduce myself. So, Yat e, Mark Charles Yinishia, Tsin Bekedene and Nishlin, Dotoi Higlini Bashishchin. In the Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Toi which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bekedene, and my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I am honored to be speaking to you today from the lands uh, of the Piscataway. I currently live in Washington, D.C., and the Piscataway are the nation that lived here, they hunted here, they fished here, they raised their family here, they buried their dead here long before Columbus got lost at sea. And the Piscataway are still here. I've had the opportunity to meet with some of them. I've been welcomed to these lands by them. And I am humbled and honored to be living on these lands that have been stewarded for these hundreds, even thousands of years by the Piscataway people. You are in Charlotte, North Carolina, and these are the lands of the um, Kataba people. And I am deeply honored for their stewardship of the lands that you are on as well. And I want to thank them for being the host people of the lands near Charlotte, and I want to honor them for being the stewards of these lands. Please let me begin this morning by saying a prayer for us. Creator, we are grateful. We are grateful for the sun that rose this morning. We are grateful for the rain that falls. We are grateful for the flowers that bloom. We are grateful for the, the leaves that turn color. We are grateful for the changing of the seasons. We are grateful for this amazing world that you have put us in and asked us to steward. Father, we thank you for another day to know you, another day to know our neighbors, another day to understand better your teachings, another day to draw closer to you. I pray that you will bless the reflections of my heart, the meditations of my mind, and I pray that we will have an edifying conversation today as we discuss your scriptures, as we try to understand the paradigm that you live in and what you're trying to get us to do or to, trying to teach us and show us through your scriptures and even through your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. For the past 15 to 20 years, I have been deeply engaged in a conversation around contextualizing worship, helping specifically indigenous peoples, like my people, the Navajo people, understand what does it mean to be native and be Christian. This is a challenge because as we talked about earlier this week about the doctrine of discovery, most indigenous peoples have the experience of being colonized by the gospel. In other words, colonizing nations came into our lands. They took those lands through the doctrine of discovery and they colonized us and either exterminated us or forced us to assimilate to their culture. And they came with this message of the Bible. And as they forcibly assimilated us to Western European culture, they presented us the teachings of the scripture. This is what the boarding schools were all about. Boarding schools run by the U.S. government and churches. The goal of these boarding schools stated was to kill the Indian to save the man to remove our culture, our understanding of the sacred, our language from us, so that we might be able to assimilate to Native American or to Western European culture and even become Christian. My grandparents were brought to Christ through the boarding schools. As a result, they didn't teach the language to my father, and he didn't know it to teach it to me. So later in my life, I actually had to move back to the Navajo Nation. We lived in a very remote part of our reservation. And I was able to 
understand at a very foundational level some of our Navajo culture. I was able to expose myself to some of the language and actually I had an opportunity to send our children to a Navajo immersion school where they could learn the language at a very young age, kindergarten through sixth grade, and get, get exposed to our culture, even to our creation stories. But this assimilation runs really deep within the church. And let me just give you an example. Let me, my, my grandfather worked as a translator for some of the early missionaries to the Navajo Nation. And he translated parts of the Bible as well as some of the songs. We have a hymnal in the Navajo, uh, in our Navajo church is called the Navajo Hymnal. And for most of our older Christians, it's one of their most sacred books next to their Bible. And one of the songs that was translated was this song. Jesus, ayo, ashotne, binadolse, shit. What song am I singing? Well, you all know it's Jesus Loves Me, right? And maybe you're thinking, oh, that was beautiful. Or maybe you're thinking that you don't have a good singing voice. Well, there's a reason I'm not in the choir. I'm actually a preacher. I'm not a very good singer. But you could tell I was singing Jesus Loves Me. And maybe you thought, oh, that's so great that they have these songs in their language. Well, we have it in our language. But you knew what song I was singing, even though you didn't understand the words. Why? Because the tune was kept. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to you, but to my elders and to people who are fluent in the Navajo language, that means a lot. Because Navajo is a tonal language. And the meaning of the word is affected by the intonation of your voice. So whether you go high or low, whether you go long or short, actually affects the meaning of the word. And so when we sing Navajo words scrunched into English tunes or Western tunes, we actually are at best turning them into gibberish and at worst saying things that are not even meant to be said. This is the challenge we face. This is why the discussion around contextualizing worship is so important. And for the past 15 to 20 years, I have been engaging in these dialogues all over the world with indigenous Christians from all throughout the world. It's what led me into my whole um, study around the doctrine of discovery. And one of the questions that I've had to ask numerous times throughout this journey is where do we get included? Where do we get included into the biblical narrative? Where do we get included into the gospel story? Not just as a Navajo man, because as you heard in my introduction, I am the son of American woman of Dutch heritage and a Navajo man. So where does my whiteness, my European ancestry get included into the biblical narrative? And where does my Navajo ancestry get included into the biblical narrative? And as I ask these questions, it's not actually where you think. There's actually a book written about the doctrine of discovery by a, a really good author. His name is Stephen Newcomb. Um, he's a leading expert in the doctrine of discovery, and he wrote a book called Pagans in the Promised Land. Now, why would he choose that word? Well, because the understanding of the doctrine of discovery is basically that non-white people are not fully human. And when European nations come across our lands, they can discover them, they can occupy them, they can exploit them, because we're not fully human. And this is literally what led to the notion of manifest destiny here in the United States, in North America. And when you look at the history of our country, it literally, manifest destiny, completing it, was literally a process of ethnically cleansing these lands. Well, how does that get justified? Well, if you read the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua, you will see what God commanded Israel to do to the pagans in their promised lands. And the actual command was to kill them, to leave no man, no woman, no child left alive. So this, obviously, the Old Testament becomes very problematic for people who are not Jewish. Right? Because the God of the Old Testament literally ordered the ethnic cleansing of the promised lands so that his chosen people could have a space. And so when, when Europeans claimed the, the legacy of Old Testament Israel, and they came to these lands and they said they were in a city upon a hill and that they were standing on the shores of their promised land and they, and they proclaimed a manifest destiny over it, this justified them to commit ethnic cleansing and genocide.
because we were pagans in their promised land. So the Old Testament is not the inclusive narrative that we want for native peoples. And even actually for white people, right? Because white people are also Gentiles. So then where else are we included? Well, some might say in the Gospels. Jesus was very inclusive, right? He touched lepers. He hung out with tax collectors and people identified as sinners. He included women. He, he worked and healed widows. He did all these things. And yes, he did. But again, when you start looking at this biblical story through more of an ethnic lens, you will notice, because you have to ask, well, how was Jesus' interactions with Gentiles? Right? Because that's where, as a Navajo man, as well as a European man of European ancestry, that's where I would be included into the gospel narrative, is through the, the inclusion of the Gentiles. And there's actually not very many stories of Jesus interacting with Gentiles, and the ones that are there are not the best examples of his inclusivity. Right? He heals the demoniac, who is a Gentile, and after this healing, the demoniac begs Jesus to let him follow him. And Jesus says, no. There's a Seraphonician woman who comes to heal Jesus, and, or to, comes to Jesus for healing for someone in her family. And Jesus says, why would I give to the dogs what was meant for the children? I came to, to preach and I came for the lost sheep of Israel. Why would I give to the dogs what was meant for the children? And the woman rolls with him, right? She says, well, even the dogs are given the scraps, allowed to eat the scraps that fall off the table. She acknowledges to Jesus in order to get a healing for her family member that in this narrative, she's a dog. Again, many pastors have tried to explain that sermon away or that interaction away, but it's not the narrative we would expect from Jesus, correct? So there's also the story of the centurion. And Jesus goes to, the centurion has a servant who's sick, and Jesus agrees to go to his house, which seems inclusive. Before he gets into the house, the centurion comes out and says, you don't even need to come in, you can do this remotely. And Jesus turns around and he says, I tell you in all of Israel, I haven't found such faith. Now, that sounds affirming, but it's actually kind of passive-aggressive, right? I can't believe this Gentile gets it. All you Israelites, you don't understand it. This Gentile gets it. If he said that about women, if he said that about another minority in today's time and age, we would see his words as offensive and even as passive-aggressive. So the three interactions we have in the Gospels of Jesus interacting with Gentiles are actually not the best examples of him being radically inclusive. So where else do we see us being included into the gospel narrative? Well, Acts 2, we have this, this story of this beautiful community, correct? People from all over the world are in Jerusalem, and they hear preaching in their own language, and they come together, and they repent, and they create this church, this beautiful image of this Acts 2 community where they're sharing meals in each other's houses and they're giving to anyone who has need. But we have to look at who is included in this community. And it's not just people from all over the world. It's Jews, people who have converted to Judaism. And when you convert to Judaism, you adopt Jewish culture. You live under the law of the Old Testament. Your language becomes Hebrew for your religious purposes. You keep the Sabbath. You are kosher. You keep the laws of clean and unclean. It absolutely transforms your culture. And that's who got converted. It wasn't just Gentiles from all over the world. It was people who had converted to Judaism. So where are we included then? Where are Gentiles included into the narrative? Well, maybe you could look at Revelation 7, right? This picture of this great assembly standing before the throne, praising God and singing from every tongue, every culture, every nation, every tribe. It sounds beautiful, right? But then we're told that they're all wearing white robes. They're all dressed the same. They all look alike. 
Now, some of the most beautiful services I've had the privilege of being involved in around the world with indigenous Christians looks nothing like that picture in Revelation 7. What makes these experiences so incredibly moving is when people come dressed in their full regalia, dressed in the, in the, the jewelry and the, and the art and the clothing, the regalia of their culture, coming to Creator through the blood of Christ in the fullness of who they are. We're not all dressed alike. So where is this radical inclusivity? Where do we see the Bible saying everybody can come? Anybody can come. And you don't have to assimilate. You don't have to become Jewish. You don't have to give up your cultural identity or your language. Where do we see that in the narrative? Well, we see it in Acts 10 and 11. I really like this story. I really like the story, right? Jesus, or not Jesus, Peter is, is out and he's, he's praying and he falls into a trance. And as he's praying, the, he sees this blanket being let down. And on this blanket are all kinds of animals, both clean and unclean, reptiles and birds. And he's told by the Spirit, he's told by God in this vision that he should kill and eat. And Peter is incensed. He's like, are you kidding me? I've never touched anything unclean. I wouldn't eat these animals. And he sees this vision three times. And as he's pondering what this means, what does it mean? Even though, according to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 7, Jesus declared all foods clean, but apparently that message didn't get to Peter, even though he was following Jesus around. Maybe Jesus declared all foods clean, but he probably didn't eat all foods. We don't know exactly. It doesn't say. But we do know here in the book of Acts, Peter is being told in a vision to eat foods that are not clean. And he's like, I've never done that before. And he's pondering it. And while he's pondering it, there's a knock on his door and there's people from Cornelius' house. Now, Cornelius is a Gentile. He's a God-fearing Gentile who prays and he, he helps people, but he's a Gentile. And he asked Peter to come <clears throat> and to share with them. And Peter, who's been prepped by this vision, goes to their house. But it's interesting because the first thing he says, right, is he says, I shouldn't be here. You are Gentiles. I am a Jew. I should not be here. It's interesting that he points that out. Right? This is something brand new. He's, he's not used to this. Again, we don't have any examples, even in the Gospels, of Jesus going into a Gentile's house. Even the centurion, he stayed outside. He didn't let the demoniac follow him. So Peter is saying, I've never been into, I shouldn't be here. And they tell him the story of how Cornelius got a vision. And so Peter begins to preach to them. And as he preaches, as he talks about Jesus, as he reminds them of things about Jesus' life, he visibly sees the Spirit coming upon them. And he's a bit bewildered. And it says, and I want to read this from Acts 10, just to make sure I get it exactly right. In Acts 10, it says, the circumcised believers who were with Peter, right, they looked at this. It says in verse 45, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Think about that. Let that sink in for a minute. Peter and the circumcised believers who were with them. Peter had never eaten unclean food before. He was very nervous and, and, and on edge about being in a Gentile's home. And when they see the Spirit of God come on the Gentiles, their minds are blown, right? Think about that. This is a man who spent three years with Jesus. Three years with Jesus. 
and he didn't get the message that Gentiles were included in this in this kingdom. Maybe it's because Jesus, again, Jesus' three interactions with Gentiles are not the most inclusive we would think about. And he was pretty adamant throughout his ministry that he was here to preach and to fill, fulfill the prophecy of the, for the Jews. So Peter spent three years with Jesus, and it's not that he was opposed to the Gentiles coming, right? He went to the house, he preached to them, and when he saw the Spirit follow them, but he was still astonished. Like, I, I didn't know this was going to happen. And when he goes, leaves that place, and the believers in Jerusalem hear about it, they're upset. What is Peter doing hanging out with Gentiles and going to their house? They call him in. Peter, what are you thinking? Let me tell you the story. I see this vision from God. I go to the house. I start preaching. I see the Spirit fall on them. What else was I supposed to do? And then the disciples, it says it was the apostles and the disciples who Peter, who were back in Jerusalem. And it says, then they said, and I'm going to read this from, from chapter 11. It says, then they said, at the end of chapter 11, or not the end, but the end of this passage, when they heard this, so Peter said, I want to give his, he said, as I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the, what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, these are the apostles and the disciples in Jerusalem, they had no further objections and praise God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So even the apostles who spent time with Jesus didn't know that Gentiles were supposed to be included. Again, they weren't opposed to it once they heard the story, once they saw what the Spirit was doing. Apparently, Jesus had prepped them to at least listen to the Spirit, even if he didn't officially tell them that Gentiles were included. I don't, we can't, I could do a whole sermon series on that whole interaction. But we have to acknowledge, in this story in Cornelius, the Spirit of God is doing something new, which is he is being radically inclusive of Gentiles not demanding them to convert to Judaism, not demanding they get circumcised, not demanding they change their diet and eat differently, not demanding they wash a certain way and do certain things, not demanding that they keep the Sabbath, but accepting Gentiles and giving his spirit out to them. Radically inclusive and something we haven't seen a lot of in the Old Testament, something we actually don't see a lot of in the Gospels, something we don't even necessarily see in that vision in Revelation 7. But in this story, in Acts chapters 10 and 11, we see the Spirit of God doing something that actually I would observe we haven't seen the Spirit of God do much prior which is being radically inclusive of Gentiles without requiring them to convert to Judaism. And that's not only where my Navajo side is included, that's where my Western European side is included. As I teach about this doctrine of discovery, I am constantly telling Western Christians, you are not God's chosen people. And Turtle Island is not your promised land. You don't have a land covenant with God of Abraham. That land covenant was given to Jewish people. And when Jesus came to the Jewish people as their Messiah, he began to transform some of their understanding of what the role of the Messiah was. And he prepared his disciples, even if he didn't have inclusive interactions, a lot of them with Gentiles. 
He prepared his disciples to follow and listen to the Spirit, which he promised he would send to them. And when the Spirit began showing up, we see the Spirit coming in Acts 2. But again, that was mostly to Jewish people. Then we see the Spirit in Acts 10 and 11 falling on Gentiles. And even though the disciples were surprised, even though they didn't know this was what was going to happen, even though they, they had spent three years with Jesus and hadn't been told that this message was meant for Gentiles, when they saw what the Spirit was doing, they opened their hearts to it. And they began to be inclusive. And this created massive challenges for the church, right? Massive challenges. This beautiful, unified Acts 2 community suddenly had to deal with the question, what do we do with the Gentiles? Do we circumcise them? Do we make them change their diet? What do we need to do? There's a whole other sermon series about that. As well as the teachings of Paul. But the thing I want you to, to understand today is the way you're not only Christians of color, BIPOC people, black, indigenous, other peoples of color who are not Jewish and have not converted to Judaism. The way, because this is the challenge, right? Because we're Gentiles to the Jews and we're savages to Western Christianity. And the way we get included into the story is actually the same way Europeans get included into the story. Through the Spirit of God falling on Gentiles, which we see in Acts chapter 10. And so as you are going as a church onto this journey of looking at the systemic racism and white supremacy that's been implicit within our doctrine of discovery, as you're looking at some of these hard questions of what does it mean to be the church in the 21st century? What does it mean to live in a radically diverse and pluralistic world? I want you to understand where you are included, no matter what your cultural our ethnic, our racial background is. I want you to understand where you're included into this narrative so that once you understand how you're included, now you are able to follow the, the leading of the Spirit and be able to include others. And that's what I think we need to be wrestling with as a church. What does it mean to be radically inclusive and to understand that we have to be very attentive to the Spirit? We have to be attentive to what the Spirit is doing and where the Spirit is at work and how the Spirit is responding. And I think the Spirit has a much more radical sense of inclusivity than any of us will ever have. And we need to follow the Spirit of God. We need to be open to what the Spirit wants to do. And this is the journey I want to invite you into. This is, it's not going to be easy, right? If we see all of the conflict and the division and the, and the wrestling that happened in the church after Acts 10, it's, it's overwhelming. But this is what the Spirit is doing. And I want to invite you into that journey. Please let me pray for us. Creator. You are overwhelming. It's so tempting to try to put you into a box, a box that we can control, a box that we can even say we understand, a box that we can, we can try to feel safe around. But you will not be boxed. You are the creator of the universe. You Everything belongs to you. We cannot control you. And we, we need to allow you to come out of the box that our culture and our biases and our need to feel safe puts you into. And I thank you for stories like this one in Acts 10 and 11 that remind us that you will not be boxed that remind us that you have a vision, you have a desire, you are going to be so radically inclusive, it's going to push us to the edge, to the brink of where we thought we could go. I pray that like 
Peter, like the disciples, who spent three years with Jesus. And while they didn't understand, they didn't know that Gentiles were supposed to be included, when they saw your spirit doing it, they were open to it. And they went down that journey. Father, grant us the same measure of faith to be able to follow your spirit on this journey so that we can see the kingdom, this heavenly kingdom that you have planned. The Shehat, creator. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.